Okay, so this is part three in our series on the superiority of rabbinic laws over Torah laws. Uh, let's start off. Well, okay. The question is is the same question we, we started off with uh, the first time. What is the impetus for following halakhos durbanan when I'm sitting alone at night in the privacy of my home? What should motivate me not to eat chicken with cheese? And then Esti's more broad and refined question, how are we supposed to relate to these different levels of halakha? Uh, how would you contrast the way we relate to doraisas with durbanans? So the plan for today is we're going to review what we covered last time. Okay, probably not uh, as in... Uh, depth as we did, you know, with the last review. And then we're going to learn the, the Ron's first answer to the question that we left off with, okay, which is really a counter argument. All right. Um, again, uh, just two, um, uh, what do you call not what's the word disclaimers, not disclaimers, reminders, reminders, okay, number one, uh, view yourself as proxies for other listeners and ask questions accordingly, meaning even if this is not your question, if you think that this is a question that someone might ask, then feel free to voice it because we'll all get clarity from that. Second reminder is uh, even during the review, you could feel free to interrupt me anytime. Um, and uh, we'll, uh, you know, we that ended up being very productive last time when we had uh, interruptions in the review and then that led to like really good clarifications. Okay, so I'm gonna rush through the review of part one and then I'll, I'll, I'll slow down a little bit for the review of part two. Part one, basic facts here. According to the Rambam and the Ran. Why do we have to keep the Rabbanans halakhically? Because the Torah commands us to in two mitzvos. Al-piha Torah asher yeruha, al hamishpat asher yom According to the Torah that they instruct you and according to the judgment that they say to you, you shall do. And then lo sasur mikol hadavar asher yagidu lecha. You shall not deviate from anything they tell you, uh, left or right. Um, Rambam says that this gives Chazal, gives uh, the Sanhedrin authority over three areas. Number one, principles learned from the oral tradition, going back to Moshe at Sinai. Two principles they derived on their own using the Midos Shatora Nidreshas Ben, the methods of biblical exegesis, which we said uh, in this category is both uh, drushos, which reveal what the terms in the Torah meant, but through the methods of drush, but then also rabbinic laws that they uh, that they support with the the methods of drush, okay, uh, which are rabbinic, and then C yeah, is the first, the first one. The first one is is Daraisa and the second one is Durban on there. First one is Daraisa, the second one is Durban on according to the Rambam and uh, not according to the Ramban. Yeah. Um, and then category C, which is what we just called the Rabbanans, which are Gazeros, Takanos, and Minhagos, decrees, enactments, and min and customs. And again, these are customs. Uh, not what we call minhagim in everyday parlance, but these are the minhagim that were officially ratified by the Sanhedrin um, that um, started from the people, but then were, were incorporated into halacha with the, author with the full authority of Durbanan. Uh, and then included in Takanos, I'm just thinking about this lately because it's uh, timely, Takanos could be either particular enactments like Eruv or Natilas Yadayim, but then it could also be mitzvos Durbanan like like um, reading the Megillah or Ne'er Hanukkah or Halal. Yeah, Brooke? Would Shomer Nagia be B or C? It's a complicated question because it has to do with what you hold Shomer Nagia is. For example, the Rambam holds that what people call Shomer Nagia is Do Raisa. Um, and, uh, and it's an open pasuk, a lo sikrubu legalos erva. You can't do any actions which lead to arayos, to prohibited sexual relations. Uh, but I think that's Makalokas Rishonin. So it, it would depend on what you hold uh, about that. Uh, so according to the Rambam, <laughs> this is actually, let's put it this way. According to the Rambam, when the Puzzle says, lo si privu legalis erva, don't come close to prohibited sexual relations from the Torah. Rambam would say that, that it is uh, do raisa, but then category A tells us that that translates into don't not doing certain types of touching that are sexual in nature. Uh, and according to those who hold that it's Durbanan, then that would be in categories B or C. Okay, so then... Uh, that takes us through, oh, and then we said that the Rabbanan, when they create a mitzvah, as long, uh, if they didn't clarify that it's rabbinic in nature, then that would be a violation of Baltosif of adding to the Torah. Okay, fine. So then this takes us to the main source. Okay, so the main source, the central source, and I'm, again, this is a review, so I'm just going to skip to the main part here, is this Gemara in the Zara that says, uh, on the Pasuk and Shir Shirin, Kitovim Dodecha Miyayin, your wine is better, sorry, your, uh, your love is better than wine, and the your is with a capital, wait, is it with a capital Y? Hold on. Yeah, it's capital Y, so I just miss, uh, 
yeah, your love is better than wine. Okay. Uh, and Ravdimi interprets this to mean Amra Knesset Yisrael The congregation of Israel said in front of God, Ribbonu uh, Olam, Master of the Universe, Aravim Alai Divrei Dodecha Yoser Shel Torah. The words of your beloved ones, God's beloved ones, uh, meaning the rabbis, is is sweeter to me uh, than the wine of Torah. We acknowledge that you could interpret that in many ways, but the way the Ron interprets it is he says. Uh, that the main reward for Torah, or at least for, for halacha, is in what the chachamim innovated and in what they enacted as a safeguard for Torah, which is what we're calling derabanans. So he learns it that you get more reward out of derabanans than out of derises. Okay. Now we said that <laughs> even though he said it in these extreme terms, this is obviously not meant to be taken absolutely literally. This is a midrash. So it doesn't mean that if you have a choice about whether to keep Torah laws or rabbinic laws, then you should like, you know, keep rabbinic laws. Uh, he, he means there's some idea here, some framework in which we can say that the main reward is from the uh, rabbinic laws. And that's what we set out to, to understand. So the Ran gave his initial answer, which is, this is still review. He says, the meaning of this statement is clarified according to what we've written, that since once the sages agree to enact a certain decree, it is immediately as if it were told to Moshe by the Almighty. Um, by rights, it is fitting. Sorry. Is there a typo here? Oh, that since once the sages agree to enact a certain decree, it is immediately as if it is told to Moshe uh, by the Almighty. By rights, it is fitting for Israel to receive greater reward for that which they accepted upon themselves willingly, meaning by enacting rabbinic decrees than the reward which they should receive for that which Hashem commands them and that which they must perform against their will. So at this point, he's saying you should get more reward for things you do voluntarily than for things that you do against your will. Okay. Uh, now we asked two questions on that. First question was, what do you mean we're doing it voluntarily? Right. We, the, the, the Ron and the Ram just got through saying that rabbinic laws are mandated by biblical laws, which is that we have to do them. So it's not willingly. The second question we asked last time was, don't Chazal teach the opposite, that you get more reward by doing something you're obligated to do than by doing something optional? So regarding the first question, oh, and then we asked the third question, which was, uh, forgetting those two problems, what, what does the Ron mean? Why should you get more reward for doing something willingly? Yeah, Brooke? I mean, I was just thinking, like, the whole thing about rabbinic decrees not being voluntary, I think part of it is that doesn't the community need to accept the rabbinic decree in order for oh, to go right, through? right. So that was, that was our answer that we said last time for uh, in what sense is it voluntary, which is we went through the Rambams in um, the, we did do this last time, I think, right? Okay, good. Yeah, I just. <laughs> I, I, couldn't, I couldn't remember if we'd done it last time or if I'd okay, done it. Yeah, else. Yeah, okay. yeah. Okay, good, good. I, I also have a hard time remembering. But uh, so we said, what does it mean that it is, in what sense is it willing? So we said that it's an interesting, I don't want to use the word paradox because that's too strong. It's interesting, like tension, which is, on the one hand, the rabbis have the authority to enact rabbinic laws, okay? However, they're only allowed to do it if they think that the majority of the community will abide by it. And then, and this is the weird part, if they think that the majority of the community will abide by it, and they enact it, and then the community rejects it, so then the law falls away, and Sanhedrin does not have the right to impose it upon people. So it is willing at the end of the day, meaning that when Chazal make a new law, you have to keep it as a member of Klai Yisrael. But if, if the majority of Klai Yisrael said, we're not keeping it, then the law would just be uh, nullified on, uh, of its own accord. So that's the sense in which it's willing, okay? And it's also willing in the sense that it wasn't mandated by God originally. You know, it's, it emerged as a voluntary thing and was accepted voluntarily in this contingent sense. So that answered our first question about why it is considered willing. Any questions on that halakha point before we go into the reward part of the review? Okay, so then we ask the question, um, why should you get more reward for doing something willingly than against your will? So I believe we gave two answers last time, okay? It's possible that there were three, and you'll remind me if I'm forgetting anything. The first answer we gave was simply that Torah is good, and if all rabbinic laws are either protecting the Torah or amplifying the Torah's themes. So then rabbinic laws just give you more opportunity to be involved in 
the themes and ideas and perfections of Torah. And the fact that you are seeking it out on your own reflects, it, it, well, it reflects a greater dedication to those truths of Torah, but it also like promotes a greater attachment to Torah because now you have more opportunities to engage in, in the Torah uh, laws itself. So I gave the example last time at length with Shabbos that uh, if you just had a bare bones de Orisa Shabbos, then um, oh, I gave this example for a different thing. Okay, well, I'll say it anyway. Okay, we noted that in Shabbos, the vast majority of what we think of as Shabbos is really Midrabana. Okay, uh, just practically, if you did like a list of, of, of prohibitions and obligations, the vast majority of them would be Durabana, uh, you know, the ones that constituted our Shabbos experience. And, uh, and all the ones that feel like Shabbos pretty much would be Durabana. And then the Duraisas are very minimal. So what does this do? is what do the Rabbanans do is by accepting these Rabbanans on ourselves, it gives us the right to, or the ability to engage in Shabbos in the Orisa themes of Shabbos in a way that's more accessible and more beneficial. So let's just take easy examples here. Um, you know, if you could, I don't know, uh, do business and go uh, do, you know, be involved in various electronics and all this other stuff that was mutter on a Orisa level, so then what would your Shabbos look like? It would look like almost a regular weekday, you know? And, but because of the Durabanans, it forces you to, um, to take the themes of Shabbos and the opportunities of Shabbos seriously and to reflect on them in a greater way. Or let's take, for example, Kiddush. Your Yote Kiddush to Orisa just by saying, hey, it's a great Shabbos, okay? But Midurabanan, they made a whole ceremony of pouring a glass of wine, saying a bracha on it, doing it before you eat. So you can now focus more on the, 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 the Doraisa themes of, of, uh, of Shabbos and what Shabbos stands for. Or let's say the three meals, you know, there's an enjoyment, there's a theme of Onik Shabbos, Doraisa. But if it weren't for the Durabanans, you would be free to, to engage in that theme to whatever extent you want. And probably most people wouldn't make Thanksgiving scale, lavish meals every Shabbos, and Shabbos would be a less enjoyable thing, you know, and you'd have less family time, less discussion time, uh, and people would just be doing their own thing. But because of the Rabbanan who said, make sure all the lights in your house uh, are on on, air, you know, on on Friday night and then make a lavish meal. So then now we, we partake of the Doraisa even more. So that's one way in which we get more reward for doing this voluntarily, that, that the fact that we accepted it upon ourselves shows that we want more opportunities to get closer to God through the Torah laws. That was one answer we gave. Any questions on that idea? Okay, the second answer, and I don't remember who said this, it might have emerged from several people, was what I call the halakhic man answer, okay, which is that the more you are involved in, so the halakhic system is one which is beautiful in its ideas, uh, in its, sorry, in, in, in the conceptual structure of the halakhos, and in the philosophical ideas and ideas of perfection that are associated. So if you just had the Doraisas, then the Doraisas uh, relate to certain areas in reality in your life. But by expanding these Doraisas with the Durabanans, it puts this, I, I, I use the analogy of like this layer, this like layer of like infrared significance over everything where anything you interact with is gonna be a halachic interaction and will give you opportunities to think and reflect and be perfected uh, either through the Chachma itself or through the ideas of perfection. And I quoted, I called this hal the halachic man idea because uh, this is a lot of what the Rav writes about in Halachic Man. And what I wanted to do actually to review this is to read you an excerpt from Halachic Man. And it was hard for me to choose what excerpt because this is throughout the book. And I chose a little bit of a long excerpt because I want to like, like try, you know, we, many of us are, you know, all of us arguably are not Halachic people in the sense of viewing everything in the world this way. We all view it in certain, you know, to a certain extent this way, but I want to read to you what a true halakhic man, the Rav, how he viewed the world, okay? So this is like a five page excerpt here. Um, and this is the Rav being poetic and philosophical, okay? And if you haven't read this before, then buckle in because it's going to be uh, 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 quite, a, quite an experience, I think. When, so this is in halakhic man, page 19. When halakhic man approaches reality, he comes with his Torah given to him from Sinai in hand. He orients himself to the world by means of fixed statutes and firm principles. An entire corpus of precepts and laws guides him along the path leading to existence. Halakhic man, well furnished with rules, judgments, and fundamental principles, draws near the world in an a priori relation. A priori meaning that he already has ideas which he then approaches the world with as opposed to 
deriving ideas from the world. Okay, so this is a priori. His approach begins with an ideal creation, that's the halacha, and concludes with a real world, real one, that's the empirical world. To whom may, be he, may he be compared? To a mathematician who fashions an ideal world and then uses it for the purpose of establishing a relationship between it and the real world, as was explained above. The essence of the halacha, which was received from God, consists in creating an ideal world and cognizing the relationship between that ideal world and our concrete environment in all its visible manifestations and underlying structures. There is no phenomenon, entity, or object in this concrete world which the a priori halacha does not approach with its ideal standard. When halakhic man comes across a spring bubbling quietly, he already possesses a fixed a priori relationship with this phenomenon, the complex laws regarding the halakhic structure of the spring. The spring is fit for immersion of azav, a man with a discharge. It may serve as mechatas, waters of expiation. It purifies with flowing water. It does not require a fixed quantity of 40 sa'a. This is all in the halakhas of mikvah. When halakhic man approaches a, uh, a real spring, he gazes at it and carefully examines its nature. He possesses a priori ideal principles and precepts which establish the character of the spring as a halakhic construct and he uses the, stat the statutes for the purpose of determining normative law. Does the real spring correspond to the requirements of the ideal halakha or not? Okay, so that's one example. He goes on. Halakhic man is not overly curious and he is not, and interrupt me at any time, by the way. Halakhic man is not overly curious and he is not particularly concerned with cognizing the spring as it is in itself. Rather, he desires to coordinate the a priori concept with the a posteriori phenomenon. Another example, uh, and uh, yeah, okay, when halakhic man looks to the western horizon and sees the fading rays of the setting sun, or to the eastern horizon and sees the first light of dawn and the glowing rays of the upper, uh, the uh, rising sun, yeah, Brooke? I was just thinking, so I'm in the middle of reading um, The Lonely Man of Faith, which is also yeah. by the Rav, and he basically describes like how in the story of creation, the whole thing about man kind of being created twice is like, you know, Adam one, I'm just like, saying this for anyone who doesn't know adam one is like they're basically adam was created twice in like two different ways and adam one is utilitarian and very like um invested in this world and adam two is very philosophical and like not like very spiritually connected but not really that physically connected and i was thinking that halakha command is a lot more like adam one like he's, yes. he's not overly curious he doesn't really question things and he's he's just interested in using things right uh, which I think is really interesting because yeah. normally Adam too is the one who's described as the spiritual one. And yet in this case, halachic man is actually Adam one. Yeah. So that, that's an interesting observation. And I, it rings true to me, uh, but I've read halachic man many times and I actually have never made it through the lonely man of faith. I've read the beginning a lot uh, and I try every once in a while, but I haven't made it through. So my familiarity with those two concepts is basically limited to what you described. So based on that, it does sound like you're correct that Halakhic man is much more like Adam one uh, than Adam two. And I've heard it said, I don't know by whom, that the Rav, when the Rav wrote Halakhic man, Halakhic man was like a depiction of his, uh, of his father and, uh, and lonely man of faith was more of a depiction of, of himself. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, and that there are, obviously the Rav was a Halakhic man also, but, um, but yeah, I would agree with you based on, on what I know of this and of uh, a lonely man of, of faith that uh, is much more like Adam one. Question? Yes. Um, but what you're saying about halakhic man is not particularly interested in the science of the things, but specifically where, in other words, he's not deriving ideas from, from the physical world. He's, right. he's going at it through with, halakha. Okay, through halakha first and then seeing yeah. the world through halakha. Exactly. And the only interest he has in the scientific reality is insofar as it concerns the halakha. Now, this th there is a bridge, by the way, and the, the, the most difficult of the Rav's books in this category is Halakhic Mind, which like, forget about it. Like, like, I can't even make heads or tails out of most of it. But the very last page of Halakhic Mind, in the last page, the Rav says that the Halakhic man's way of being oriented towards the world will facilitate his pursuit of a scientific way of thinking about the world as well and will will like equip him with the tools needed to do that uh but uh right now in his ideal depiction of halakhic man he's he's this halakhic man is not interested in science okay thanks yep okay let's go uh and see this other example here when halakhic man looks to the western horizon and sees the fading rays of the setting sun or to the eastern horizon and sees the first light of dawn and the glowing rays of the rising sun he knows that this sunset or sunrise imposes upon him a new obligations and commandments. 
Dawn and sunrise obligate him to fulfill those commandments that are performed during the day, the recitation of the morning Shema, Tzitzit, Tefillin, the morning prayer, Etrog, Shofar, Halal, and the like. They make the time fit for the carrying out of certain halakhic practices, temple service, acceptance of testimony, conversion, halitza, etc., etc. Sunset imposes upon him those obligations and commandments that are performed during the night, the recitation of the evening Shema, Matzah, the counting of the Omer, etc. The sunset on Sabbath and the holy days, uh, sorry, and, and holiday eves sanctifies the day. The profane and the holy are dependent upon a natural cosmic phenomenon, the sun sinking below the horizon. It is not anything transcendent that creates holiness, but rather the visible reality, the regular cycle of the natural order. Halakhic man examines the sunrise and sunset, the dawn and the appearance of the stars. He gazes into the horizon. Is the upper horizon pale and the same as, uh, as the lower? He looks at the sun shadows. Has afternoon already arrived? When he goes out on a clear moonlit night until the deficiency of the moon is replenished, he makes a blessing upon it. He knows that it is the moon that determines the times of the months and thus all the Jewish seasons and festivals. And this determination must rely upon astronomical calculations. Uh, another example, when the halakhic man chances upon mighty mountains, he utilizes the measurements which determine a private domain, a rishus hayachid, a sloping mound that attains a height of 10 handbreadths within the distance of four cubits. When he sees the trees, plants, and animals, he classifies them according to their species and genera. Many laws are dependent upon the classification of the species. When a fruit is growing, halakhic man measures the fruit with the standards of growth and ripening that he possesses, budding stage, early stage of ripening, formation of the fruits or leaves, and reaching one third of the complete ripeness. He gazes at colors and determines their quality, distinguishes between green and yellow, blue and white, etc., between blood and blood, between affection and affection, um, i.e. between the various colors of vaginal blood and skin uh, uh, affections, uh, according to Rashi. He investigates the matter of nurturing uh, of the nurturing of trees and plants, the relative importance of the branches vis-a-vis the roots. He approaches existential space with an a priori yardstick, the fixed laws and principles, precepts that were revealed to Moses on Mount Sinai, the imaginary bridging of the spatial gap less than three hand breaths, the, imagine, the imaginary vertical extension upward or downward of a partition, the imaginary vertical extension of the edge of a roof downward to the ground, uh, the bent wall, the measurements of four square cubits, 10 hand breaths, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. He perceives space by means of these laws, just like the mathematician who gazes at existential space by means of the ideal geometric space. Okay, one more, just bear with me. Uh, we gotta fill out this perspective. A lucky man explores every nook and cranny of physical, phys physical biological existence. He determine, determines the character of all the animal functions of man, eating, sex, and all the bodily necessities by means of halakhic principles and standards. The bulk of an olive, kazais, the bulk of a date, kukuseves, the time required to eat a half loaf uh, meal, pras, the time required to drink a quarter loaf, revis, eating in a normal or non-normal manner, the beginning of intercourse, the conclusion of intercourse, normal intercourse and unnatural intercourse, et cetera, et cetera. Halakha concerns itself with the normal as well as the abnormal functioning of the organism, the laws of menstruation, the man or woman suffering from a discharge, the mode of determining the onset of menstruation, virginal blood, pre, uh, pregnancy, the various stages of the birth process, the various physical signs that make animals or birds fit or unfit for consumption, et cetera, et cetera. There is no real phenomenon to which the halakhic man does not possess a fixed relationship from the outset and a clear definitive a priori orientation. He is interested in sociological creations, the state, the society, and the relationship of individuals within the communal context. The halakha encompasses laws of business, torts, neighbors, plaintiff and defendant, creditor and debtor, partners, agents, workers, artisans, Baileys, etc. Family life, marriage, divorce, chalitza, sota, conjugal refusal, the respective rights or obligations to, and duties of a husband and wife is clarified and elucidated by war, the high court, courts, and the penalties they impose are all just a few of the multitude of halakhic subjects. The halakhist is involved with psychological problems, for example, sanity and insanity, the possibility or imp uh, impossibility of a happy marriage, uh, migo, uh, uh, the principle that a party's plea gains credibility when a more advantageous plea is available, available and assumptions as the intention behind the specific act, umdana, the presumption that a particular individual is a liar or a sinner, the discretion of judges, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the measure thereof is longer uh, than the earth and broader than the sea. Okay, so, um, uh, okay, so that, I think that's the, uh, th that's why I wanted to get across here. So, so the point is that, that if you think about how halakhic man approaches reality just with the Torah, okay, Torah laws extend to everything here, but what do the rabbinic laws do? Is they give you even more of this these, these categories on a uh, on a particular a more particularized level and quantitatively more opportunities to be involved in halacha. So everywhere you turn, there's mounds and mounds of halacha and thousands and thousands of, of opportunities to, uh, opportunities to explore ideas. I remember um, uh, one of the um, the the uh, the guys in my yeshiva. Uh, in my time, who was older than me, uh, now Rabbi John Siskovic, uh, was trying to convince, there was a guy in the yeshiva who was there for like, from a non-religious background for uh, like, he was only going to stay for like a year. And, and, uh, and Rabbi Siskovic was trying to convince him to, uh, to, to devote more time to learning. And so this, this, this kid was very interested in science. Okay. 
And, uh, and so, so Rabbi Sisikovic said to him, like, you know, are you familiar with like, you know, the various disagreements between Einstein and, uh, and, uh, and Bohr or Einstein and Newton? And he was like, yes. You know, he was like, they're beautiful conceptual, uh, uh, um, beautiful conceptual uh, machlokas, uh, conceptual disagreements that like furnish you with like, like hours of thought and like, like, you know, marveling at beauty of the ideas. And he's like, yes. So then uh, uh, Rabbi Sisikovic pulled out a Gemara and opened a page and he says, each page of Gemara is filled with dozens and dozens and dozens of instances of, uh, of conceptual thinking that is as, as beautiful or more beautiful than, uh, than a single mach locus in science, you know? And he's right, is that, that science, because it's trying to get down to the fundamentals, you know, takes a very long time and, and, uh, and will be by nature uh, fewer in number in terms of the conceptual, uh, um, the opportunities for conceptual thinking than in halacha, which is multitudinous. So a person who is involved in halacha and especially in halacha durabanan will have ample opportunities to be involved in this type of thinking. Okay, so that was a review of what we said. The second reason that if you accept this upon yourself voluntarily, then you are engaging in, you're creating more opportunities for yourself to be involved in this type of thinking and, and, uh, and uh, you know, love of God through the, through chachma. Okay, so that's the end of our review, okay? I'm gonna add one more answer to this, uh, which to me kind of overlaps both of those other answers, but I think it's, it's significant on its own. And I'm actually going to cheat and read something that I wrote over the summer. Um, I wrote a one, one page article entitled Halacha as a Playground of Mindfulness. Um, and I'm not going to read the whole article, even though it's only one page. Uh, I'm going to read parts of it. So the article was prompted by this cartoon, which, if you can see on the screen, is a fishbowl. Oh, sorry, a fish in a fishbowl, and that fishbowl is in the ocean. Okay, um, and there's another fish looking at the fish in the fishbowl. They're looking at each other. There's a fish outside the fishbowl in the ocean, looking at the fish in the fishbowl, and there's a, a, a label of the the fishbowl pointing to the fishbowl that says religion. And then uh, the fish who's looking at the other fish from the ocean, it says spirituality. So what I wrote here is um, that I, actually maybe I will read it, it's only one page. Uh, Last week I saw a comic depicting a fishbowl in an ocean, floating in an ocean. The fish in the fishbowl is labeled religion. The fish in the water outside the fishbowl is labeled spirituality. The implication is that the the spirituality fish is looking upon the religion fish with pity as if to say, you poor thing, why do you insist on being confined to this fishbowl when you could be free in the ocean, like me? The comic had been posted in a mindfulness group on Facebook. This is not the first time I've encountered an underlying streak of anti-religious religious sentiment among self-identified practitioners of mindfulness. I don't blame the creator of the comic. Okay, I'll skip this part. Um, uh, uh, oh, yeah, fine. Oh, I'll read it. Okay. I wrote this for a reason. <laughs> I don't blame the creator of the comic, nor do I blame those for whom the comic resonates. As an Orthodox Jew, I would even describe myself as anti religious. Uh, and if that sounds like a paradox, read my article as Judaism or religion. Still, it irks me when I see legitimate criticisms and complaints about other religions indiscriminately applied to Judaism. And this is a perfect example. The sentiment in this comic is the polar opposite of my own experience as an observant Jew who aspires to live a life of mindfulness. I agree with the image and the captioning of the comic, but I disagree with its implied value judgment. Orthodox Judaism is like a fishbowl in that it imposes restrictions on an otherwise unrestricted life. Those who choose not to observe halakha are like fish in the ocean in that they aren't confined. However, being unconfined is not the same as being free and the boundaries of halakha constitute a path to true human freedom. This is not a chiddush, a novel insight. Um, Okay. uh, I've given Shirim and written articles about my own take on the liberating qualities of halakha, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, oh, my favorite of these is I hate sukkah in a good way, in which I draw upon conclusions from uh, uh, the, from the dialogue of my dinner with Andre and the teachings of Bruce Lee to frame halakha as a system of skillful frustrations designed to promote our development as truth-seeking human beings. We're going to get to that later on today. But while I have written articles on the relationship between halakha and freedom, I haven't addressed the relationship between halakha and mindfulness, specifically the type of mindfulness valued by those who agree with the comic. Chapter 14 of Greg McEwen's book, Essentialism, The Disciplined Pursuit of Less, is entitled Limit, the, the Freedom of Setting Boundaries. The author illustrates this counterintuitive point with an anecdote. Quote, this truth is demonstrated by the story of a school located next to a busy road. At first, the children played only on a small swath of the playground, close to the building where the grown-ups could keep their eyes on them. But then someone constructed a fence around the playground. Now the children were able to play anywhere and everywhere on the playground. Their freedom, in effect, more than doubled. 
Similarly, when we don't set clear boundaries in our lives, we can end up imprisoned by the limits others have set for us. When we have clear boundaries, on the other hand, we are free to select from the whole area or the whole range of options that we have deliberately chosen to explore, end quote. Halakha transforms every aspect of life into an anchor for mindfulness. Our fish bowls, the boundaries created by our halakhic obligations and restrictions serve as our prompts. By surrounding ourselves with these manifold mindfulness prompts, we enjoy countless opportunities for awakening. And since all the mitzvahs have reasons to develop our intellects, our character traits, or to promote justice in society, these prompts not only pull us out of the trance of mindlessness, but they also develop us in specific ways. In other words, not only do they facilitate awakening from, but also awakening to. Halakha guides us towards mindfulness in everything we do. For these reasons and more, I believe that the fish inside the bowl enjoys more freedom than the fish in the ocean. Yeah, Brooke? So this made me think a lot about art because yeah. um, one of the, the things, kind of the rules within art is that you need to have some sort of restriction for your right. creativity before you start. Because if you have no idea like what you're doing and the prompt mm -hmm. is big and there are no kind of like set boundaries for what you're going to create, then regardless of how creative you are, you can't really do anything. So you need exactly. to establish boundaries. And I, yeah. I think that it like, I was actually talking with someone about this um, the other week and I use the same example because like, I think a lot of what people find about halacha to be so limiting is actually what inspires all of the creativity inside. Agreed, 100%. And the reason why I immediately agreed as soon as you said art is because one of the things I quote the most is uh, the quote from the head designer of Magic the Gathering, Mark Rosewater, who says, uh, restrictions breed creativity. You know, whether that's in art or game design or in life, and um, it's very hard to look at a blank page and think like, like and if someone says write, write, write an article uh, and you just have a blank page, like there's infinite possibilities. But if they say, write a, a, a one page article about this prompt, you know, then immediately your mind starts thinking. And the same thing is true in life um, that the type of creativity of exploring the world as a truth seeking intellect and developing yourself, it's much, much, much uh, easier and, and directional, that's not the right word, but uh, um, has, it gives you much more direction when you have these boundaries and these goalposts that fence you in. I mean, I, I often think about the fact, I haven't had a desire for this because I, I, I hate going to the city and doing things, but like when I first moved to New York, then, uh, then like it, the thought occurred to me that like, you know, I, I, I remember this very distinctly. It was, uh, it was on a Friday night and I was walking uh, I think I was walking to shul and the thought occurred to me, like, if I wanted to, I could just get on a train and go to Manhattan, which has literally everything in the world, <laughs> you know, like, like, like I could like, you know, like anything people want to do, you could find some way to do it in Manhattan, but halacha is what's keeping me, uh, uh, attached to Shabbos and Shabbos is what facilitates my development as a human being, you know, and like if a Jew who doesn't keep halacha has all these opportunities and it looks like tremendous freedom, but because they could do anything, then there's no direction. And even if they have a direction, there's nothing that forces them to keep fenced in, you know, to fence them in to like, like keep them on that track. And Halacha does this. And just segueing back to um, the answer that I'm giving to the question of how this relates to Durbanans is, is the Durbanans create the vast bulk of the restrictions that we experience. And what, it, what they do on a very minimal level is they give you opportunities to pause and not just give in to your desires freely and it creates opportunities for mindfulness. And that's not even based on like knowing what the purpose of the halakha is. In other words, let's say you don't even know what you're doing with halakha. Halakha just gives you pause and pulls, gives you many opportunities to pull yourself out of mindlessness. And then when you add to that, the fact that all the halakhas have reasons and the Durbanans are reinforcing, you know, the activities that, that, that promote those perfections. So then you have even greater opportunity for, uh, for developing yourself and all from, from, from boundaries and restrictions. Okay. Yeah, I would, I would just add one more thing, just sure. in terms of the critique of the cartoon. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it necessarily, it's funny because the boundary of the comic itself, this is a little yeah. meta, but I don't mean it specifically in the meta way, but like the boundary of the comic itself leaves out the experience of being free in the ocean. Like in other words, it right. just seems to be it's this fantasy that just having all the space is good, but you know what? There's also predators there. And there's also right. like your food is, is much more scattered and you have, there's like a lot of other things. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
But right. it's kind of ironic because it really is being left out in order to portray the idea. But ideas don't work like that. You, you, exactly. You, you, need, yeah. you need boundaries in order for anything to be meaningful. Right. That's a good, 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 uh, very good point. Uh, that's a, uh, one, of, one of the uh, reasons Shlomo Melch warns against uh, uh, metaphors is that metaphors are only, you know, highlighting certain qualities and like, uh, and, and omitting others. Okay, so now, uh, unless there are other questions, now we're ready to tackle the question that was raised last time. Okay, so the Ron had said, you get more, it's, it's, you would, should get more reward for what you accept upon yourself willingly than what is forced upon you. So now the Ron says, he raises the question on his own. He says, do not challenge me based on that which Chazal informed us and mentioned in many places. One who does a mitzvah and is commanded, meaning obligated, is greater than one who does a mitzvah and is not commanded. And Chazal say in Kedushin 31a regarding Dama ben Nesina, who was a non-Jew who honored his father in an extraordinary fashion, and non-Jew being significant here because uh, he's not obligated in Kibbutz Ve'im. So the Gemara says, now, if one who does a mitzvah without having been commanded, like this non-Jew, receives such a reward, then one who does a mitzvah having been commanded, al-achas kama v'kama, then even more so. Okay, so now he's saying, don't we have hold the opposite, that, that you get more reward if you're forced to do something? Okay, so he answers this, he says, regarding this teaching, I have three out, our arguments. So let me tell you what he's going to do structurally before we actually read his arguments. And we're only going to get through one today. What he's going to do is he's going to show you how, based on his understanding of why someone who is, uh, um, uh, okay, sorry, let me, let me start that again. He's going to show you how, even though we have to keep the Durabanans, then we get all the perks of being forced to keep them and therefore it's superior, but we also get all the perks of doing them voluntarily because the entire institution is voluntary. So he's going to say you can have your cake and eat it too, okay? That you basically get all of the, the extra reward of taking something upon yourself and doing it willfully, and you get the reward of doing it uh, against your will and being forced to do it because you have to keep the rebuttons, okay? Okay, so argument number one, he says like this, um, uh, uh, and I'm going to actually read this in Hebrew, uh, uh, along with the translation. Hataina ha'achas shemin ha'yidua. Oh, no, I always forget this. This is the bad Hebrew version, or the uh, possibly incorrect Hebrew version. I'm going to use the English here. The first argument is, it is known that that lefum tzara agra, that in accordance with one's um, uh, uh, tsar, the suffering, which a person undergoes in his service, in God's service, is the increase in reward. Okay, Chazal already stated, lefum tzara agra, according to the suffering is the reward. So this is a known principle, which we're going to have to get into and define. Um, and it is known that one who is commanded in a mitzvah and does it is not opposed by his yetzer to not do it, his inclination to not do it, since he wasn't commanded in it, and uh, as it would oppose one who is commanded. Okay, just in plain English, what that means is if you have to do something, there is tremendous resistance on the part of your, your emotions, uh, your yetzer, whereas if you, because you're being forced to, Whereas if you are not commanded and you're just doing this uh, in terms of an option, like it's an optional thing, and you could take it or leave it, then there's not as much uh, opposition from your Yitzhahara, okay? And he gives an example in the Gemara. So let me back, give background information here. So on Yom Kippur, then there is a man who is designated to take the Seir La'azazel, the, the scapegoat, and lead it out into the desert uh, and, uh, and then throw it off the cliff, right? Push it off the cliff. Um, and, uh, and you got to remember he's fasting. Okay. So you're, you're fasting on Yom Kippur and you're walking through a desert. So what are you going to be afraid of? You're going to be afraid. I'm going to die out here because I don't have any food, uh, and water. Okay. So what the Ron is going to quote is that there was a practice that they had these little booths all along the route where they had water and, uh, like emergency provisions that were there in case the guy felt like he needed to eat or drink. So the Ron says, in this vein, Chazal said in Yuma, the distance from Yushalayim to the cliff was 90 ris, it's a unit of measurement, with 70.5 ris to each mill. At each and every booth, they would say to him, here is food and here is water, in order to ease his desire, since he was not compelled to fast, uh, meaning like, like he, 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 you know, if he needed to, he could break his fast. But as they said in, in the Gemara, it was taught in the Brisa, no one ever had the need to partake of the food and water. Uh, so in other words, in, in, in terms of in history, no one ever um, actually like needed to break his fast uh, with these uh, emergency provisions. So why did they offer it to him? Rather, it was offered because, now here's the line, the hunger of one who has bread in his basket does not compare to the hunger of one who does not have bread in his basket. The, the expression is, I think, 
Lamisha Ainlo Pospisalo. You can't compare someone who has bread in the basket with someone who doesn't have bread in the basket. What does that mean? So bread in the basket means that if I have, so if I'm starving, the mushal is if I'm starving and I have bread with me, then my hunger is not as bad. Okay. And I think we experienced this. I don't know if you've experienced this, but let's say it's on Yom Kippur and it's at the, in the Elah. You're extremely hungry. But as soon as the fast is officially over and like you're, you're, you're going home, like you'd see, you could see the bagels somehow, like you're not suffering as much, right? Why? Cause now, you know, you can eat, <laughs> you know, it's the, the pain of like being restricted uh, against your will increases the hunger pangs. But when you know that you've got bread in your basket and you can just eat whenever you want to. So then it's not as bad. Or I've heard, I haven't experienced this, but like people who are addicted to smoking say that like on Shabbos, it's not so bad. Like, oh, wait, no, that's the opposite. <laughs> Sorry. Forget that. <laughs> Forget that. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, uh, uh, pretend I didn't say that. Okay. So then the Ron concludes his argument. He says, uh, and therefore one who does a mitzvah that they were commanded to do, whose yetzer opposes them because he does not have bread in his basket, meaning he has no choice. He has to do it. And they nevertheless overpower the yetzer and subdue it. Their reward is greater than one who does the mitzvah, but was not commanded to do it. Um, who's free to do it whenever they happen to choose to do so and neglect to do it whenever they wish. Okay, so let's just make sure we understand his basic argument. So he's saying like this, that if you are doing a mitzvah, let's take shofar, right? Women do not have to hear shofar, okay? So if on a particular year, then a woman does not want to go to shul to hear shofar, then she doesn't have to. And if she does want to do it, she can do it. But there's, it's like, you know, God is saying no pressure, you don't have to do it, Okay. But a man is forced to, like, no matter what, you have to go to shul to hear shofar. Um, I had this situation <laughs> this year where I, I uh, the first time that um, this has happened on the second day of Rosh Hashanah, I didn't know that I had gotten this really bad stomach bug. Uh, and like, you know, and uh, it ended up spreading to like uh, dozens of people in the community. And I was like extremely nauseous to the point where I felt like if I moved, I would throw up. And it was the second day of, 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 of Rosh Hashanah. And like, I, I was like, I, I have to go to shul to like be involved in davening and like, like hear the shofar. And there's this tremendous pressure. Like, what am I supposed to do? And like, at that moment, I envied, I was like, wouldn't it be great if like, this is just an optional thing, you know? So, so, but the thing is, is that the, the, he's saying that the reward you get from overpowering your Yitzhahara and doing it is greater than the reward that you get when you could take it or leave it. Okay. So we're going to read the conclusion of his argument, but then we're going to go and analyze that part because that's the, the crux. He says like this, but that which was agreed upon by the sages of Israel has become for us and for them, once they have agreed upon it, like the mitzvot that are explicitly stated in the Torah, and we have become like those who do mitzvot having been commanded in them. So what he's saying here, and this, this we might not get to today, he's saying on the one hand, rabbinic laws are are willingly accepted upon themselves by Klal Yisrael, like we talked about last time. On the other hand, once Klal Yisrael accepts them, they become mitzuva ba'oseh, they become obligatory. So you get both perks. You get the perk that, that these are optional laws that Klal Yisrael accepted upon themselves, and you get all the reward for everything we said last, last week. But then you also now are forced to keep them, which make, means that you get all the perks of, of, of Mitsuva Veosa, of being commanded and doing them and overpowering your Yitzhahara. Okay. So forget that last part. Let's just focus on what, what is the- I, I didn't I, understand that point. I just didn't understand that. Sure. He's saying like this, that he first made the argument last week that rabbinic laws are accepted upon, uh, we accepted them upon ourselves voluntarily. And therefore, by all rights, we get greater reward. Okay, for all the reasons we said, either halakhic man, you know, or like you're choosing more involvement in, in the system or like taking upon yourself more opportunities for mindfulness. Um, so these are all like, like we didn't have to accept those things, but we did and we get greater reward because it's voluntary. But once we accept it upon ourselves, it becomes mandatory. And then this principle kicks in where if you do something because you're forced to do it, your Yetzirah will be stronger and you'll have greater suffering. And when you overpower your Yetzirah, you get greater reward. So you can, that's why I'm saying you can have your cake and eat it too. Rabbinic laws are voluntary in character, but they're mandatory in experience. And, and that experience of being forced to do something and not having bread in our basket and needing to grapple with our Yetzirah, that gives us greater reward.
I'm just as like opposed to Torah there, laws, right? as opposed to Torah laws, which are only mandatory. We never were able to engage in the Torah laws on a uh, uh, in a way that can be characterized as as by choice, except for us, Gary. So you're actually having both experiences. You're something? having both experiences. He's saying, yeah. Now, if you're wondering to yourself, how can you have both experiences? Like, do I relate to it voluntarily or do I relate to it like as a mandatory thing? That's a problem I have with this run, but we're going to tackle that probably next time. Yeah, although I do think that like everyone kind of knows that their abundance are like a little different and there is a different struggle just experientially with it. Mm -hmm. Right. Their abundance are different, but, the, but I think the thing is like this, is if you really realize that their abundance are obligated from the Torah, you know, based on the two missiles to Arisa, then you really wouldn't relate to it. You would relate to the particular maybe as voluntary, but like the force that's that's keeping you um, uh, in check with the Durabanans is the same force of a Durisa. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so that, that to me, that's a, a problem. Okay, but let, let, let's forget that uh, for today. And today what I want to focus on in the remaining half hour is what is this idea that Lafum Sara Agra, that according to the pain is the reward, or according to the suffering is the reward, or what's this idea that that the more suffering, uh, sorry, that the that if you're obligated to do it and you have to overpower your Yetzer, then you get a greater reward for that. Like, what is that idea? Why should you get more reward for something that you suffer through for overpowering your Yetzer? Are you asking the question for us to answer? Yeah, I'm asking know? the question for you guys to answer. Yeah. Uh, so we have an idea of um, that you're really exercising more like your understanding, your commitment when you're when you're being pulled in the other direction. It enforces the part of you that's really a person instead of an animal to to be acting. OK, good. OK, good. So so if you really um, are either uh, let's say your Yeter is not opposed by it, uh, let's say it's uh, something that you love to do. Right. So then you don't really have to engage in the human part of yourself, of the Telem you know, the, 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 the truth-seeking reality perceiving part, or in Bechira or in free will, you just are attracted to it like, like an animal, right? It's pleasurable. Um, but the fact that you feel like I don't want to do it because I'm being forced to, uh, you know, or I just don't like the actual activity, it forces you to engage in asking yourself, well, why am I doing it? What are the benefits of doing it? You know, you have to actually make a, a free will decision. Like Chazal say, you have to be mechashev hefsed mitzvah keneged schara the uschar avera keneged hefseda. You have to weigh the pros and cons and the, the gains and losses of doing the mitzvah or doing the avera. And so you engage on it in a human level. And because you're engaging on it in a human level, so then that perfects you in a way where, where just volunteering to do something or doing it because you like it, uh, uh, you wouldn't gain from. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Okay. Okay, good. That's a good answer. Anyone else have another answer for why um, why doing something that you're forced to do and struggling and overpowering your Yater is gives you more reward than the other way around? I was thinking about how we're agents of free will. Yeah. Um, you thinking about free will? Shocker. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and um, I mean, we are pre-programmed to think that we have free will. Mm -hmm. but, <laughs> yeah. Um, I can't argue with that, actually. I can't argue with that. Yeah. No, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, um, so I think that part of following halacha, like specifically in this, like, time where it's not enforced and people have to actively take it upon ourselves yeah that we are making ourselves more holy by like using our free will to like decide to do something and i think a lot of it is like buying into the system as a whole like when yeah. you sign up for it you sign up for all of it right um and so I think it's more difficult to buy into the system as a whole when you have additional um, responsibilities and obligations. And so I think like that kind of get that reward kind of gets disseminated throughout the mitzvot of you signed, you are obligated to do this, yes, but you could like reject that calling and you could be irresponsible and you could still choose not to do it. 
So like, just like any other Jew who's told like, you should do this, you can say, no, I don't want to, and just not. But because you, it's not just that you say like, oh, like maybe I should, or whatever. It's that you have a responsibility and you are owning up to that. Yeah. Okay, good. So I like the, the phrase you use of like buying into the system uh, and, and these Durabanans being uh, like particulars of the system as opposed to like intrinsic pillars of value. Okay. And I'll give you an example of this. Uh, I've used this example a lot, but um, you know, I love teaching. Okay. And I taught in high school. Uh, I taught high school for, for uh, you know, 12 or 13 years, depending on how you count the COVID year. Um, but uh, the, um, there are, so in my job, I loved actually teaching. However, you know, there are lots of things you have to do as a teacher in a high school that have nothing to do with teaching uh, directly, you know, like attending faculty meetings, uh, or like, you know, parent teacher conferences, or, um, you know, proctoring. uh, And, uh, and so these are like, are drudgery in the sense that when you're doing them, you're not doing the thing you love, you're not teaching, but because it's a package deal, they're part of the system, then, then it forces you to, uh, to like, like, like you're saying, confront the fact that like, look, I value the system at its core and the system is a package deal. So if I want to teach in a classroom, I have to do all these other things. And, and can you elaborate on what you meant when you said it makes you more holy? Because I think that that's a true statement, but I, uh, and I have my own idea of what you mean by that, but tell me what you mean by it makes you more holy. Okay, well, there's the whole idea of, you know, angels are agents of God and they have no free will. They're just kind of extensions, sort of like a limb. Yeah. Right. And humans were created in order to make decisions for good or bad. So right. the free will is actually the aspect in which we can be most like God because we have the ability to choose wrong and we also have the ability to choose right. And right. when we choose to ignore our Yetzirah and to actively follow God's commandments, we are like making this much more, like an angel can never choose to disobey God because an angel is just like, you know, it, it was, it's like a tool. Right, um, robot. And, yeah. And humans are this, like, we, like, make ourselves holy in our ability to choose to do the right thing, despite having the option to do the wrong thing. Okay, right. So, so, and, and, and if you plug that back into the, uh, to the answer, so how can the Ron originally have said that the main reward you get is for the Durbanans? So I think that gets down to the quantitative issue that, again, take our Shabbos example, instead of having, like, you know, uh, X number of choices uh, of opportunities to practice to uh, to practice choosing freely, you have now X plus a thousand, you know, uh, with all the Durabanans and every single moment is another opportunity to engage in that in, in exercising your Bechira muscle, not that there's a Bechira muscle. Yeah. Okay, that's good. Uh, I have a different meaning of what it means to become holy, which is the basis of my answer, but uh, I'll, I'll hear if anyone else has other explanations uh, uh, first before we go into my answer, then we could do that. Okay, so my answer also involves that you're more holy, but I have a different definition of holiness, okay? And before, yeah. I, maybe strength of mind. Okay, strength of mind, yes. This, this, uh, this uh, is more related to strength of mind, okay? Um, actually, I'll say it at the outset now, I guess, just to- Wait, Where is the word thing. holy that we're, where, where is this holy? Uh, so I think the clearest place that we say it is in every bracha on a mitzvah. Uh, that God has, has, has made us holy through his mitzvos. Vitzivanu and commanded us X, Y, Z. So the mitzvos are things that make us uh, kadosh. Or we say in the Shema, in the third paragraph, um, uh, I can never quote stuff out of context without going through the whole thing. Wait, I can never do this. It, it, it's embarrassing. Hold on. Uh, what does the Shema say? Let's just look at... Uh, where, where is the word Kadosh? Are we, like, why are we talking about the word Kadosh? I don't know if I... I I'm well. just getting it from what Brooke said, but now I'm attaching it to the Pesukim. That the mitzvahs make us Kadosh. And so Brooke was saying that the, um, that the, that the fact that the Rabbanans are part of this system of making us Kadosh, and there are many more opportunities to make us kadosh, then that's why the main reward is from the the the, the uh, Durbanans. 
Yeah, the phrase I was looking for is, yeah, there we go. Laman tiz keru v'asisem es kol mitzvosai v'isem kadoshim levakehan. In order that you remember and do all my mitzvos, and you shall be kadosh to Hashem, your God. So the mitzvos make you kadosh. Okay, so the, uh, so, so, um, uh, okay, actually, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to tie this to a sporno just because I can. Um, uh, so Brooke, so, okay, so the sporno says, uh, the Puzzle says, that what makes us human, God says, uh, uh, why am I not? Okay, Nase Adam Bitsalmenu Kidmuseno. Let us make man, oops, sorry, uh, let us make man in our form like our likeness. Okay, so the Sforno on that says, um, Bitsalmenu Shihu Etsem Nitschi Vesichli in eternal rational essence. Okay, that's what it means. That's what Selim Elohim means, um, which is uh, 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 the part of you that is eternal and rational, okay? And then Kidmuseinu is B'inyan Hamasios, has to do with our actions. She Yedame Bam Ktsas Lepomayo Shamala, that we are similar to them in part to the upper uh, existences, uh, meaning the angels. But Sad Ma Shehim Polim B'yadio Vahakara, because they act with um with uh with knowledge and with recognition Amnam, however sam, their actions he built their actions are not with free will like Brooke was saying and man is not similar to them in that respect and in another respect man is, is comparable to god because god acts with free choice but god's bahira is always for good but that's not true for man's bahira and with this, God's Bechira is on a higher level than man's Bechira because God's Bechira is always for good. That's why it says we are like, that God says, let us make man like our likeness, not uh, like our likeness, not in our likeness in truth. So in other words, what defines man is these two qualities, is Bechira in action, free will in action, and then being a rational intellect, uh, a rational uh, uh, essence. Okay, so Brooks' answer of what it means to be, so, and then Sforno, any place where you look at the Sforno talking about being holy, then he reiterates these two uh, these two statements. So, for example, in Parshas Kedoshim, Sforno says, and this better be right. I'm just banking on on knowing Sforno. He's yeah. He says like this. What does it mean to be kadosh? He says. Um, that the, the purpose of all these uh, wa- uh, warnings is to be holy. This is uh, that we must resemble God as much as possible. As is the intention in the, um, in the creation of man. Uh, let us make man, uh, man in our form like our likeness. Uh, that's why it says here, uh, uh, like I am Hashem, your God. The Roy Shetidamu Eli, Kefiha Efshar, Be'iun Uvamase. We need to resemble God in study, meaning in the mind, and in action, meaning in choices. So Kedusha encompasses these, these two areas is that we become, we can't actually be Kadosh like God. God is pure intellect, and God is absolutely free, and, and his freedom is good. But what we can do is we can transcend our animalistic nature. Right, that's what kadosh literally means is to trend is to be to differentiate ourselves, and we can resemble God in acting with bechira, even though it's our bechira and not God's bechira, and we can resemble God in strengthening the part of ourselves that is uh, as eternal and uh, and rational. Uh, again, like God is eternal and rational, even though it's a different kind of eternality and rationality. So, Brooks' answer is focusing on the kadusha element of free will. Um, the other element of free will is uh, is the strengthening of the mind. Which I think is like, um, I mean, SD is kind of a, 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 a related to both of them. And then my answer is going to have to do with what you are transcending, meaning that instead of being like an animal, you are being like God in terms of your mind and your free will. Okay. How so? So this is what leads us to the Rambam. Okay. That was kind of a, a, a longer segue than I thought. Anyone have any questions on what we mean by Kedusha here? I, I didn't intend to present this in terms of Kedusha, but I was going with what Brooke said because it, it makes sense. Okay, so there, what we're going to do for the last part of today is, to, in order to expand upon what I, what I think the answer is here, 
um, to the question of why do you get more reward for going against your Yeter? We're going to read the sixth chapter of the Ramam Shmona Parakim, okay, uh, his uh, introduction to Pirkei Avos. And the chapter is so small that we can uh, we can read it uh, in its entirety, okay? And the title of the chapter is Behevdil Ben HaChasid V'HaKovesh Es Yitzro, the difference between a Chasid and one who conquers or subdues his inclination or controls his desires. Um, chasid, people translate as pious, and th this translator translates as, as eminent person, and he'll define what he means by both of them. Okay, and I'm going to go ahead and default to this translator's translation here uh, until I see something that I uh, prefer my own translation. The philosophers explain that one who controls his desires, although he may do lofty things, nonetheless does good while longing and yearning to do bad. So this is the first personality. The Kovish as Yitzro is someone who basically wants to do bad, but conquers his Yitzro Hara. Okay, that's the Kovish as Yitzro. It is just that he struggles with his longings and withstands the promptings of his personal bent, desires, and disposition, and does good deeds while suffering in the process. Okay, and keyword suffering here, okay, because that's what we mean by, that's what the Ram is going to eventually connect to, the Fum Tzara Agra, according to the suffering is the reward, the suffering meaning going against your desires and overpowering them. In contrast, the Chassid, I'm just going to say Chassid, the Chassid's actions are prompted by his inherently noble desires and dispositions, and he does good deeds because he longs and yearns to do so. Okay, so here we're defining Chassid as someone who, is, who he says, inherently noble desires. The, what the Ramam actually says is, is Tavaso Utrunaso. His desire and his disposition uh, are yearning towards the, the good. Um, he desires to do good. Okay, so just, you know, find examples in yourself. Okay, there are certain mitzvahs that you naturally desire to do, and then there are mitzvahs that you, you, you really don't desire to do, and you have to force yourself to do them. Okay. Uh, yeah, Brooke. I mean, this is interesting to read about how, like, he's basically saying that there are people whose desires and disposition make them actively want to do the wrong thing. Um, because yeah. does halacha approach humanity as being inherently good? Um, halacha approaches humanity as being inherently free. That's one way to look at it. The other way to look at it is that man is by default bad, okay? Because, and bad, not in the sense of like uh, Hitlerian evil, but bad in the sense of dominated by your Yitzhahara, dominated by your animal instincts, because you're, uh, like Chazal say, the Yitzhahara has a 13 year head start on, over the Yitzhahara Tov. When you're born, you only have your Yitzhahara. It, you, you just are operating on your animal instincts. And then your Yitzhah Hatov only starts to come online at the age of 13 for boys and the age of 12 for girls, you know, like your intellect. So, so that's not in, that's inherent in the sense of like, you are born, ki Yitzhah Leif Adam Ra Minurav. You were born with an evil Yitzhah, evil in the sense of animalistic and not guided by intellect. You're born that way. And then you, you emerge at the age of Bar Bar Mitzvah as a being who is capable of Bechira. And then you have to become good. So I don't know if that answers your question. Okay. Okay, so now the- something? Yeah, sure. Yeah, this just reminds me also of um, uh, Rabbi Man gave a shir on Miguel Rus, where, where ah. Nami, Nami was pushing away, pushing away, pushing away Rus, and yeah. then she saw her like strengthen herself to do it. And the Zelna Gon says, that's how you know, that's how she knew that she was really functioning in the right way because right. she was struggling. If she had been like all gung ho about doing everything to go with her, then she would have been suspect that it was not by the right motivations. Yeah. He said, if it's your Yetzer, your Yetzer Hara, well, uh, he said that was actually her Yetzer, her Yetzer Tov, I think. I forgot which way he was saying it, but it's like the opposite of what you would think. But he was, oh, he said, if you're excited to do a mitzvah, then it's yeah. coming from your Yetzer Hara. Yetzer Hara, right. Yeah, and if you're struggling, then you know that it's coming from the right place and that right. that was why she accepted her as a, a gift. Correct. Yeah. So that's why I'm smiling and, and, and rejoicing because uh, I had heard that quoted many for many years and it, we finally saw it inside last week in my Mishle share. Uh, and so I was like, uh, I was like, finally, like I, the, the source actually exists, you know, uh, I'll add one thing though, which is that even though the Vilna Gon says that you, you're, that if you're excited to do a mitzvah, then that's your Yitzhahara. Um, I don't know what he means by early that. On. Yeah, it was early on, right? Early on. Was that? It, like, early on in a person's commitment. In other words, not later on in a person's development. Yeah, because I was going to say that, the, what's the ideal? The ideal is that you're doing it with your Yitzhahara. That's Yitzhara, that you serve God with both both Yitzhars. Um, you know, but uh, but yeah, I think his point was more for early on in a person's, uh, you know, 
what what is the um oh, there's a great quote from Mary Carr from the memoirist so uh, I, th I think it's from her just one second I have to read this quote because it is really good and it's related to this uh, and I'm going to say this in terms of a, 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 a timely example um uh the you know let's say like uh, a Malay, right? So it's very fashionable um, to say that um, that you know any person who goes against uh, the Jewish people, um, uh, uh, like any any sorry any nation that that is like anti-Semitic is a Malay, okay? And like whether that's a true idea or not, people say that, and so people get very zealous when it comes to like like you know. Um, uh, 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 the, you know, destroying uh, 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 anti-Semites, or even more so, people get very zealous when it comes to like, like, like going after heretics, okay? So this is actually not Mary Carr, this is Anne Lamott. Anne Lamott says, you can safely assume that you've created God in your own image when it turns out that God hates all the same people you do. <laughs> okay, in other words, that if it turns out that all the same people you hate- That's hilarious. <laughs> yeah, this is a great, great quote. Um, so, um, so uh, that's like the Vilna Gones thing is like, if, if, it, if it happens to be that all of your enemies also are God's enemies, chances are you're just projecting and that's your own Yetzirah, you know, it's not really coming from uh, your desire to do God's will. Okay, so now the Ramam goes and he compares the two people, the Kovish is Yetzirah and the Chassid. And again, I'm going to use those terms in Hebrew because I think it's better. One who conquers his Yetzirah and one who is a, a Chassid who's, who naturally desires to do good. So he says, Thus, the philosophers determine that the eminent person, the chassid, is loftier and more perfect, perfect than the one who controls his, his desires. And I think we would say that, right? We would say, like by, by uh, inclination, if you naturally desire to do good, then of course you're on a higher level than someone who wants to do bad and then like forces himself not to. Uh, like if you're doing a mitzvah lishma, you want to do it, right? It's not like you're forcing yourself to do it. Okay. They added, though, that someone who controls his desire is on par with a chassid in many ways, but his level is decidedly lower than, than his because he, the one who controls his desires, still longs to do bad. And even though he does not do it, this is in itself an inherently bad disposition. Uh, in fact, King Solomon said much the same when he declared the soul of the wrongdoer yearns for wrongdoing. That's nefesh rasha ivasa ra. Uh, the, nefesh, uh, the soul of the rasha has a taiva for ra. And when he referred to the joy that the chassid experiences when doing good, as opposed to the suffering, uh, an, uh, when he referred to the joy that a chassid experiences when doing good, as opposed to the suffering, i.e. the inner conflict and struggle that a non-chassid experiences doing the very same thing with, he says, uh, Simcha la tzadik asos mishpat umchita lafo le'aven. It is a joy for the tzadik to do justice and destruction to the doers of iniquity. Thus, the Torah and the philosophers seem to agree. So that's step one. He says, it would seem to be that the Torah agrees with the philosophers that someone who naturally desires to do good is on a higher level than someone who overpowers his yeter. Okay. But, he says, when we examine what the sages say about this, we find that they deem one who wants and yearns to sin but doesn't is loftier and more perfect than one who does not yearn to sin and does not suffer in restraining himself from doing those things if, you, if there were such a person. In other words, they seem to say that the Kovish as Yitro is on a higher level than the Chassid. In fact, they said that the greater and more perfect a person is, the stronger his cravings for sins and the greater his suffering in denying, themself, uh, denying them to himself. Okay, so that, you know, if you have a greater taiva to do an Avera and you conquer it, then you get more reward. Okay, uh, they cited personal examples and concluded kol yitro gadol mimeno, that the greater a person is, the greater his yitrohara is. Not only did they say that, but they also said that the more a person who controls his desires suffers in the process, the greater his reward. As they put it, lefum tsara agra, according to the suffering is the reward. And that's why I, that's what led me to this Ramam here. Okay, so now he's gonna, oh, sorry. They even commanded us to control our desires and personally warned us Never to say, I'm going to say this in the Hebrew. Um, never to say, Ani mi tivi any mis avila vera zu, vafilu lo asar tahatora. They said, you shouldn't say, quote, by nature, I don't want to do this avera, and, and I, would, uh, I, wouldn't do it, uh, I wouldn't do it even if the Torah didn't prohibit it. Okay. Vuhu Amram, and this is the statement in Chazal, Rabbi Shimon ben Gamliel Omer, Lo Yomar Adam, E. F. Shi Lech, Basar Bukhalav, E. F. Shi Lil Boshatnes, E. F. Shi Labo Alha Erva. A person should not say, quote, I don't want to eat milk and meat. I don't want to wear shatnas. I don't want to have a, a prohibited uh, sexual relation. Ella, 
Efshi uma esev v'avi shebashmaim gazar alai. Rather, a person should say, I want to, but what can I do? God decreed upon me. So there they're saying that if you, seemingly, if you have a desire to eat milk and meat and to wear shatnas and to have prohibited relations, then you're on a higher level than someone who says, I don't want to do this. Okay. So now we have a seeming contradiction. On the one hand, the Torah and the philosophers say that you're on a higher level if you naturally want to do good, and you're on a lower level if you are fighting and struggling with your desires. But then Chazal seem to say that you're on a higher level if you're struggling with your desires, uh, that the greater you are, the more yitzhi you're going to have, and the more reward you get. And it's bad to say, I don't want to do this, but rather you should say, I do want to do this, but God commanded me not to. So that seems to be uh, that, that these two uh, positions are at odds. Okay. And that's what the Rama says. Now, cursory reading of the two viewpoints would lead us to believe that they contradict each other, but that is not so. In fact, both are correct and they do not disagree at all. So here the Rama is going to explain this. For what the philosophers consider bad, the sorts of acts that would make a person who does them, who does not want to commit them loftier than the one who does, but controls his desires so as not to do so, are the sorts of things commonly accepted as bad, like murder, theft, robbery, fraud, harming an innocent person, ingratitude, holding one's parents in contempt, and such. In fact, they, they are the sort of prohibitions about which the sages had said, quote, had they not already been written in the Torah, they would not, they would, uh, they, had they not already been written, they would have to be. It's easier in Hebrew for some reason. Um, that if these had, let's say the Torah had not prohibited murder, the Torah should have prohibited murder. Okay. In other words, um, these are things you would do even without Torah. Some modern scholars who caught the disease of the mutakalimun refer to these as reason-based mitzvahs. He calls them disease because all the mitzvahs are based on reason. But what he means here is that like human intellect naturally dictates that you keep these mitzvahs. He says, there's no doubt that the person who would long and yearn to commit any one of these sins would be flawed. For a lofty person would not want to commit a single one of them, nor would he suffer by restraining themselves from them. So in other words, if you say, I want to murder, but what can I do? God said not to. You're on a lower level than the person who doesn't want to murder. Or if you say, I want to steal, or I want to lie, you're on a lower level than the person who naturally doesn't want to do those things. Okay. But he says the sort of actions which the sages said that anyone who controls his desires rather than commit them is greater and his reward is higher than that of the chassid who doesn't control his desires at all are what the aforementioned modern scholars refer to as the uh, authority-based mitzvos, the mitzvos hashimios, uh, meaning the mitzvos that you do because the Torah said so. And this is true for were it not for the Torah, they would not be considered bad at all. Hence, they are the ones the sages said that one should allow himself to long for and only deny them to himself because the Torah deters us from them. Okay, so he gives a proof. He says, in fact, observe that their very examples reveal just how wise the sages were. I'm going to switch to Hebrew here. Lefish lo amar, they did not say, lo yomar adam efshi laharog and hanefesh, efshi lignov, efshi lachazev, el efshi uma ese. Chazal did not say, quote, a person shouldn't say, quote, I want to kill, I want to steal, I want to lie, but what can I do? God decreed me on, uh, on me not to. Okay, they didn't say that. Ella his kir, rather they mentioned in Yanim Shekulam Shimios. They they said only things that are authority-based mitzvos. Basar Bakalav, Levishash Shatnez Ba'arayos. Okay, uh, meaning this is what we, we call uh chukim. Okay. Um they only listed chukim. And by the way, when he says arayos, he means the arayos that are chukim. Uh, for, uh, there's one of the arayos which is not a chok, uh, at least, which is uh, adultery, because adultery is something that societies would prohibit it, even if uh, the Torah didn't prohibit it. Um, but he's talking about chokim like, uh, you know, like, uh, sorry, he's talking about arayos like the other, um, the other types of, uh, of, of prohibited sexual relations. So he says, uh, mitzvus elu, oh, sorry, uh, skip, go to the English, for, the, for they, i.e. the authority-based mitzvahs, are the sorts of mitzvahs God refers to as chokim about which the sages said, you have no right to doubt any of the ordinances I decreed for you. Um, even though, as the Talmud continues, the goyim retort against them and the satan denounces them, for example, the red heifer, the scapegoat, and the like. Thus, those mitzvahs which are like the aforemen which the aforementioned modern scholars refer to as reason-based ones are called mitzvahs in the sages' words. Okay, forget that. It is thus become clear from all that we said which, uh, which sins make a person who does not long to commit them greater than the one who does long to commit them but controls his desires to do so. 
and which are the ones about which the opposite is true. That is both, both a marvelous novel point and a wondrous suggestion as to how to reconcile these two statements, i.e. those of the philosophers and those of the sages, and the terminology proves our point in both instances. We have thus completed the subject of the chapter. So let's summarize here. He's saying that if you're talking about mitzvos that are what we call mishpatim, the ones where the reasons are evident, the ones that we would have kept even if the Torah hadn't commanded them, the ones that other societies have, like murder, theft, lying, there you're on a higher level if you don't even desire to do them. And if you desire to do them and force yourself not to, then you're on a lower level. Okay, but regarding the other mitzvos, what we call chukim, the ones where the reasons are not obvious, the ones that we are only doing because the Torah said not to do them, like milk and meat and uh, the rest of kashrus and shatnas and the arayos and the red heifer and the scapegoat, for those mitzvos, then if you, uh, then you are on a higher level if you control your desires. And there's nothing wrong with wanting them because there's nothing wrong with pork. There's nothing wrong with chanas inherently. There's nothing wrong with these arayos, but it, you're 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 keeping those mitzvahs because the Torah pre prevented you from doing them. And therefore, if you therefore, I'm, we, and we have to explain this. Therefore, he's saying if you grapple with your desires you're on a higher level than one who, who just like doesn't like the taste of pork or person who was like raised to not, you know, to not uh, eat Basar Bukhalov, okay? So that's the Ramam's explanation of this, that th this is the type of suffering of grappling with your Yitzhahara that the Torah is talking about is suffering in forcing yourself to keep things which are not intrinsically bad, okay? And the question I have, and I, I hope we can give some explanation of this before we end today. The question is, why is that like, why is that superior? In other words, if I say, why is the person who says, oh, I hate pork, why is that inferior to the person who says, oh, I love pork, but I'm controlling my desires? What do you say? Isn't that the same thing that we were talking about before? Okay, so two of the answers that you gave before do work out, okay, which is that, that um, there is nothing wrong with pork but there are philosophical reasons why the Torah prohibited you in, or you know, obligated you in the laws of kashrus. And you should really be keeping the mitzvahs because of those reasons. So that's like what Essie was saying, where, where let's say you hold that the reason for kashrus is, is actually, let's, kashrus is actually a more difficult example. Let's use Shabbos, okay? So there's nothing actually wrong with like striking a match on Shabbos, okay? But what is the Torah? Why is the Torah prohibited? Because it wants you to use this as an opportunity to reflect on, on the act of creation and on God resting. So if you so if you want to strike a match on Shabbos, that's fine. But you now have to engage with the part of you that says Shabbos is valuable because it reminds us that God created the world, and you think about all those ideas of perfection. Or according to what Brooke said, there's nothing wrong with striking a match on Shabbos, but what, what, what you do is, is if you desire to strike a match, you have to grapple with your Bechira and exercise your Bechira muscle and you perfect yourself that way. That's why you get greater reward. But what I want to say is, is a, a point that underlies those two, which is that there is a perfection in overcoming your Yetzer itself. Okay, that let's say you didn't even know the reasons for keeping Shabbos. And let's say you were like... Um, you know, not at the level of Bechira yet. Bechira, like, you know, is going to involve like some recognition of, uh, of reality, you know? Let's just say you're, you're on the level where you just, you know that this is Usr and you really, really want to do it. What I want to say is that there is a perfection to be gained in just exercising self-control, okay? Not on a Bechira level, just self-control, just not giving in to your animalistic desires. And that perfection is going to be greater in those areas where the thing that you're controlling yourself for is not actually harmful. Okay. Like, like, you know, there is nothing wrong with eating pork. It's just exercising your self-control. And what I want to say, and I'm kind of like rushing this last part because we're already over time is all the Durabanans, I can't say all the Durabanans, the bulk of the Durabanans prohibit you from doing things which are not intrinsically harmful. Okay, if they were intrinsically harmful, arguably, then the Torah itself would prohibit you, you know, from, from doing them. But all of the Durabanans are, are prohibiting you from doing things which are just precautions or which are just reinforcing the Orisa themes. So what I want to argue is this perfection of just exercising impulse control and controlling your desires and like, you know, uh, uh, strengthening yourself and, and, and just not living like an animal 
you get many, many opportunities to practice those things with Durabanans and quantitatively, then the bulk of your reward is going to come from that. So to just summarize all three of them together, it, I'm viewing that as the lower level, okay? That, that by keeping these Durabanans that you're forced to keep, you practice self-control and not living like an animal. Built upon that is, is what Essie was talking about, which is like really acting like a Tzalem Elohim and engaging the truth-seeking part of you uh, uh, in, in, in assessing, well, why am I doing this? What is the value in doing this? And then mediating between the two is what Brooke was talking about, which is practicing free will of like, you have the world of the animal instincts, and then you have the world of developing as a cell in and you have to like exercise controlling yourself between those two. And the Durabanas just give you many, many more opportunities to, uh, to practice that. End of story for today. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure what, what what the way that you just said what what it sounded like. What I was saying wasn't really what I was saying. I think I was I was mm. just saying you're just being a person. If you're just whatever the reason that your mind is telling you to do this. I mean, is that the last point? Actually, not. The, no. So I'll right? give you an example. I'll give you an example. Like a kid who really wants to eat uh, uh, food, and then the the parent says you have to make a bracha first. So, I mean, maybe you can argue with this, but like. So the, the kid is not really being like a person. The kid is still doing it like, you know, on a Yitzhahara level, you know, but the kid is exercising self-control. Uh, okay, yes, very valuable. Just the practice yeah. of it. Yeah, right. And, and that's why I, I think all three answers that we gave go together. And what you're calling being a human does encompass all three things, like separating yourself from the animals, you know, thinking about lofty ideas uh, and like like perfecting yourself as a Salman Lakim, and then like just being caught in, in that world. And the kid is not caught in that world yet. The kid is just like one desire versus the other. Like, like I want to appease, appease my parents, but I also want to like eat this candy and they have to exercise some level of self-control and not just give into the most animalistic thing. And the Durabanans give you lots of opportunities to do this. Okay, so right. let's leave off the question. So the question I have, and this still bothers me, okay, is when the Ron makes that last move, when he says, but that which we have agreed, so after having this whole idea about overpowering your Yetzer, which I think is like in line with what the Ramam says, I think of all the ideas, by the way, I was drawn to this one because the Ron puts the emphasis of doing battle with your Yetzer Hara. He doesn't put it in terms of Bechira, and he doesn't put it in terms of Selim Elohim stuff, uh, or like true human, I mean, you could say that this is the true human thing, but he puts it in terms of Yetzirah, and that's what drew me to the Ramam's uh, um, explanation. But then the Ram ends with saying, but that which was agreed upon by the sages of Israel has become for us and for them, once they've agreed upon it, like the mitzvahs that are explicitly stated in the Torah, and we have become like those who do mitzvahs having been commanded in them. So he's saying that once the Rabbana, so even though the Durabanans are voluntarily accepted upon ourselves initially, once it becomes accepted, it, then it becomes like God commanded them. And it is mitzvah v'ose. The Ron is trying to say that you can have your cake and eat it too. That on the one hand, we get all the perks of keeping these as voluntary mitzvahs, but then we also are forcing ourselves to reckon with them and to overpower our yetzer. Something doesn't sit well with me about that because experientially, we do have to keep them. We're not in a position where we where we can choose to reject them. So make up your mind, like either we relate to them as optional voluntary things that we're taking upon ourselves, in which case we don't get this benefit of grappling with our Yetzir, or we treat them like any law of the Torah and it's God himself commanding them to us and we face the Yetzir opposition. Which way is it? I don't have a satisfactory answer for that, for that this week. So we'll have to focus, uh, come back to that another time. Thank you. Yep, thank you. And no shear thank next you. week because it's Shushan Purim. Uh, and so Blee Netter will continue the week after that. Okay, I won't be there then. Okay, that's right. Thanks for reminding me. Okay, have a good uh, Shabbos and a happy Purim if I don't see you before then or even if I do. Okay, bye. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you.